Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Got Mental Health Podcast. I am your co-host, Rachel Cove. I'm the owner of Transformational Solutions, a life coaching business that specializes in addiction, trauma, and self-destructive behaviors. I'm an author, podcast host, group facilitator, speaker, and co-creator of the online eight-week self-development course, The Visions Program. I'm your co-host, Arthur Mogilevsky, a business entrepreneur, dad, animal activist, and owner of AM Healthcare, California's leading dual diagnosis and mental health treatment centers, focusing on comprehensive and immersive treatment experiences with a network of facilities and dedicated professionals committed to providing each and every client the intimacy and care they so richly deserve. This is the Got Mental Health Podcast, a fun, open, and safe space where we talk to experts, thought leaders, and professionals in the mental health field. Our goal is to educate, inspire, and empower people to take care of their mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Join us weekly to hear Arthur talk like this as we talk all things mental health. Follow us wherever you go to get your podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review as it really supports our show. Thanks, guys. And keep listening to Arthur. Welcome back, everybody, to the Mental Health Podcast. I am your host, Rachel Cove, along with my co-host, Arthur Mogilevsky. Mogilevsky, Rachel. Okay, whatever. Um, I want to welcome Robert Schulz to the podcast, who I have interviewed before, and you are one of my favorite people to talk to about the subject of bullying that we're going to discuss today. Uh, so Robert Schulz is a licensed marriage and family therapist and professional clinical counselor. He has served in many clinical and leadership roles over his 25 years working in university, community, mental health, forensic, and private practice settings. Robert is well known for his work for a trainer and consultant in assisting schools, universities, and communities preparing for and responding to major crisis events like wildfires, mass shootings, interpersonal violence, and other tragedies. Robert has served as an adjunct professor of psychology at Pepperdine's Graduate School of Education and Psychology for many years and has authored numerous publications on the topics of disaster mental health, addiction treatment, and men's mental health. He is an active member of the threat management community and has held positions with leading organizations such as Deep Prep Safety, the National Association of Behavioral Intervention and Threat Assessment, and the International Alliance for Care and Threat Teams. Welcome to the show, Robert. Welcome, Robert. Thank you so much for having me. And Rachel, like you said, this is, you're one of my favorite people to talk to. Oh, so, that's and now nice. I get to talk to Arthur too. So thank you for having me oh, so much. The expectations are so high right now. Yeah. So uh, for those who are listening, I interviewed Robert on another podcast that I have with my family called Kicking It With The Coves. And we were kind of referencing and connecting the show Cobra Kai with just your expertise around bullying, because obviously the show Cobra Kai is predominantly about bullying. And so I feel like I never have enough time to talk to you, Robert. So I'm so grateful that you're coming on here to kind of expand upon this subject and pick your brain more around this subject. Because for me personally, this subject is is very near and dear to my heart to, uh, to help people find solutions for this because I feel like almost every single day I'm talking to people who have been so deeply affected by bullying, whether it was in their childhood, whether it was in their experience in high school, whether it was in their families. And a lot of people just throw their hands up in the air and don't know what to do. And sometimes I feel like I throw my hands up in the air and I don't know what to do. And so I kind of wanted to really get very honest and, and, and talk deeply about, you know, what people's experiences are like and, and what are some concrete solutions for families, for teachers, for professors, for, uh, for college coaches, for high school coaches, because I feel like uh, we have to get honest about how much this exists everywhere. Yeah, it's, you know, I, like I was reflecting as you were talking there, you know, it, this isn't anything new. Like bullying behavior has been going on probably, you know, since any time people have been together. 
you know, and, and there's lots of reasons why it plays out, which we can talk about. Um, but I was just even reflecting on like when I was a kid, you know, I, I don't think bullying was really talked about. But as I go back and I think about situations like in my elementary and middle school years, there were definitely either situations where I was observing bullying behavior and or, or maybe was even on the, the victim side of the bullying behavior. And, you know, those feelings are still there. Even though you know maybe it didn't have like a like a really traumatic event happen, um, I think most people can really relate to it and identify with it on some level through some experience they've had in childhood or adulthood, where they really felt like they've been on that either on the end of a bullying situation, or they've watched it unfold and maybe didn't know what to do or how to label it or what you know what to call it. So I think it is a shared experience that most people have had on, on some level an experience with. Um, and I think we're doing hopefully a little better job of helping people know how to identify and respond to it, both on an individual family level, but also a systemic level, you know, in communities and schools. That's really what a lot of my work is about is, you know, how do we educate to help people um, know how to work through situations, how to empower schools to do things that are helpful, to not do things that are not helpful, uh, to to help people get through these difficult situations. Robert, I, I love the fact that you're on here today and we're talking about this because, like Rachel mentioned, bullying is it's a systemic issue. I feel like it's everywhere, especially with social media. It's heightened to a whole nother level. Would you agree that the definition of a bully was somebody who was at one point in time bullied themselves? Yeah, you know, in Rachel and I, we, we kind of pulled that, we held that out and talked about that um, on another occasion. I think there's definitely, you know, there's sort of the assumption that all kids went through, all kids who are acting out um, bully behavior had some sort of an overt bullying experience <clears throat> um, where they were the victim. And actually, at least from the research on that, is that there's definitely a group that that is true for. Mm. But then we also know that there's, when you look at kind of the histories of those kids that are bullying, maybe they didn't have a situation where they were bullied directly or physically bullied, mm. but they oftentimes had other issues of like neglect or issues like where they really weren't taught how to manage their emotions real well or going through some other sort of issue in their life and didn't have like effective ways to know how to resolve conflict with another person. So I think there's, well, there's clearly that group that is, you know, what I would kind of call them the sort of the bullying reactive group. They've had this done to them, therefore they're going to do it to other people. It is kind of a, it's a mixture of what leads a person to that place where they're going to act out and bully another person. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's interesting because let's say there is bullying happening in school. There's the group that's doing the bullying or the person, the individual. Then there's the bystanders that are around them, which I, I learned really about the psychology around the bystanders through you. Then there's the teachers, which could also be considered the bystanders, correct? Yes, absolutely. And then there's the victim, the person who's being bullied. So we have to look at the impact of each group. Why does someone not stand up to a bully? Why does, and this is a real thing that's happening because I've had many clients, I've seen it firsthand where adult figures of authority will not step in when there's bullying happening in a high school setting with teenagers. What is going on there? Because for me, <laughs> And it's and it is complicated. I don't want to simplify this and say it's one thing or it's that because it's not. There's many factors that play into this outcome that is being experienced in high school a lot. But what is that? Why are teachers afraid? Why would a teacher be afraid to step in and get involved when a kid is being bullied? Yeah, well, we can I mean, we can start on the teachers. And we can talk about even from an administration level, but you know, I mean, if you know, if you know teachers today, like, you know how challenging their work is, you know, like all the stuff that teachers have to deal with in addition to, 
kind of what their their job is, which is to, you know, impart information to the kids and but they're they're dealing with a lot. And I don't know that that and I think it is different than it was 10 or 20 years ago. I when I talk to teachers today, they are really overwhelmed with the the social and emotional needs of kids. You know, we've just come through this really challenging period of time, you know, with the pandemic. You know, we we know kids are a couple of years behind really in their development, not just academically, but you know, socially, emotionally. So for I think for teachers, and I'm not making an excuse for them, there's probably some conscious or unconscious decision making that's going on. Do I want to step into this? And what will it mean if I do choose to step into this? You know, it's going to mean reporting it. It's going to mean parents are going to have a response. And and I think that, you know, that that's true not just for teachers, but it's true for everyone. We have kind of a we have an a, we have an economic decision-making system that goes on in our head all the time that's sort of evaluating what's this going to cost me. Mm. And and I know that may sound selfish, but I'll I'll admit myself, you know, like like we're constantly having to make decisions and we're evaluating sort of the, the pros and cons of doing something or not doing something. So I think that's one part of it. I think there's the other part of it too that depending on kind of on on the kids involved, you know, sort of their perceptions of of the bully or the the child who's being bullied. Um you know, we know in schools, and, and of course, you don't need to look very far in the headlines of situations where, you know, we see kids that have status in the schools, whether it's because they're the star athlete or they're the, you know, star of the play or whatever, they have a role. And there's this sense that, you know, I think in some schools that those kids are a little more protected, mm. um, that, you know, we don't want to we don't want to rock the boat because we don't want Johnny to not be able to play in the game on Friday night. And and I think there's a there's probably a, that factors into some of the decision making at times. And and we also see how it plays out sometimes where when someone does make a report, um, that reporting person really there's some real consequences for the person who's doing the reporting. So I think there's, as much as we would love to think, and again, I, I, I put myself in this boat of thinking, oh, yeah, it's really straightforward. You know, we see a bullying incident. It's just going to make perfect sense to go report it. I think there's a lot of things that sometimes work against the reporting. Or we can kind of tell ourselves, well, you know, maybe somebody else will report it. Or because the victim didn't, you know, come forward and isn't crying um, isn't in great duress. Well, maybe they really aren't that hurt. They're just playing around. It was just a prank, you know? Um, and, and so we even can kind of play with how we, how we talk about it. And, and I've really been giving this a lot of thought as I'm doing some writing on the subject. We don't always call like, like a physical bullying in many cases meets the criteria for assault and battery. And we don't call it assault and battery, do we? We call it bullying. Um, and, and yet I think a lot of times schools are apprehensive to call it, like in its legal terms, <laughs> because of what that would mean. Mm. And, and again, I, I think there's some, you know, we want to be aware that, it, you know, the, the most common time that bullying occurs is middle school. That's the, the peak time of bullying behavior but that's what the research shows at least why would that not be that it doesn't occur not that it doesn't occur in high school not that it doesn't occur in elementary school but that that's a pretty peak time you know for kids and you know and i understand why we're hesitant to kind of give it a more formal term or a legal term but at the same time like some of the behavior that occurs is it's really harmful and if it was outside the school setting we wouldn't have any problem calling it what it is. Why would it start in middle school? Is it because developmentally they are starting to seek security from their peers versus their parents? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, well, I mean, I don't, you, I don't know how, if you remember middle school, I, I remember middle school. 
Um, I, I'm thankfully it only lasted three years <laughs> <laughs> for me. Um, but clearly, you know, the, the, the changes that occur, I mean, right. I think to your point, Rachel, the significance of peers in a, in, in a kid's life, it definitely changes during those years. Yeah. I also think there's a bit of a, I, I think from a parent perspective, there's a bit of a stepping back and, and kids are sort of on their, on their own more, you know, I mean, that's one of the things I noticed when my kid went to middle school, it's like, oh, I'm not invited to campus as much. I'm not as involved in things as much, which again, I think developmentally, there's a reason for that, but it also, we're, we're sort of pulling some of the training wheels off, um, some of the things that helped to guide behavior, pro-social behavior. And now we're kind of, we're putting them out there more on their own. And, and kids are trying, they're trying to figure out, you know, what's my role in this group? How do I, you know, what's my identity at the school? How do I, how do I get to be known? Like what, I mean, again, remember back to when you were in middle school, how many different identities did you try on? You know, as you're going through middle school and high school, you're just trying to kind of figure out who you are. In that process, though, I think, you know, there's a lot of stepping on toes because you're very focused on self. You know, you're really just, you're so kind of, you know, into how you're presenting and what you're going to get out of things. You're not always aware of how your behavior may be affecting other people. Yeah. I remember remember when I went to middle school. I mean, I was trying to figure out what group I'm going to assimilate with, whether it be the popular kids, whether it be the skater group, whether it be hardcore Asian uh, anime group, whether it be the basketball people. I remember I would get into fights because I had something, I had a proof, something to be a part of certain groups. And it was it was very difficult because, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times people are put, kids, especially at that age, are put in positions where they don't feel like they want to be, but they have to be in order to assimilate and kind of grow within a community and find that identity, right? You got lucky, three years. I think, what was it? No, actually, no, I think everybody's sixth, seventh, and eighth, right? Yeah. Well, sometimes, no, I think sometimes they're starting now younger. I don't know, but I agree. I mean, it's such a confusing time. It's, I feel like it's an exciting time. I remember feeling excited about it felt like I was maturing I didn't know it consciously but it felt like there was this pull towards oh I'm becoming more independent mm-hmm. I remember my twin brother and I my dad got us a, a cell phone and we it, it felt like I was an adult mm-hmm. it was it was <laughs> like oh my god and it was it was not an iPhone it was not a flip phone there was no games on it it was one of those like brick phones but we shared it and it was really exciting. And it was, it was also, so I, I always had, and I've always been blessed to have my twin brother in school with me. So no matter what, I always knew if something bad has happened to me in school, I could always turn to my brother. But a lot of people don't have that. And, and school, and I, 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 and a lot of the groups I run, I, I talk about the impact of the family on the psyche of an individual and then I have them look at what was your experience in school because that's eight hours of your day five days a week that you're getting affected by things and sometimes I think teachers know that they have such a huge impact on someone's life and sometimes I don't think they know how much of an impact they have on people's lives how do we create more awareness around the need for empathy and and connection in school and how do we create a dynamic where we talk about hey I need connection it's not this shameful experience to say I don't have anyone to talk to because that was my experience in high school in high school I didn't have any I didn't feel like I had anyone to talk to and and it led to alcoholism and it led to depression and a lot of kids are suffering with that right now so do you feel like it's creating and normalizing language around feelings? Like, what do we do around that? I know that was a long question, but. Yeah. Well, I think it goes to, like, what you're, what you're getting at, there are two things I want to comment on. One is that we know the importance of kids having at least one mentor outside the home. Mm. 
We know that we know that that's a crucial data point. Interesting. That if kids know they at least they have one other person other than mom or dad to go to. Can, can it I, creates it creates a kind of another layer of protection hmm. in their life. Can I get in yeah. can I get into that? Yes. I, I love that yeah. you brought that idea up, right? Cuz I mean, we want to be about solution orientation. There's people that are listening like like I like I have a kid and I'm like I do I want her to be the bully? Do I want her to be bullied? What how do I raise so that what, what are the principles? I feel like it's so tough on parents cuz there's such an emotional connection of love yeah. and fear that sometimes you might not give the best advice in a real life scenario mm. because you're trying to protect. And and so can you dive into that? Like how does someone how does a kid find someone that they can find as a mentor? Mm. Like what what does that yeah. process look like? Great question. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think it, uh, I think, so, you know, sometimes it just sort of happens. Um, and, and again, sometimes it ha even happens within a family, you know, that there's, you know, Uncle Mikey or Aunt Sue or, you know, that that kid has in their immediate life that they have access to on a regular basis. And they have some comfort with sometimes it happens, you know, with a coach. You know, and that that coach is someone who becomes that outlet. Um, but I, I kind of view it though as as my job as a parent, not to not that I'm trying to control who my kid's mentor is, but I do want to really have an eye on who are the other adults around my kid, mm. and wanting to make sure that they do have other people, and that I'm working to parent in a way that helps to facilitate this sort of community effort of raising my kid. Right. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm potting my kid off to other people, right. but you know, I think there was a time when, you know, again, I, I, I speak as someone who, you know, you know, most of my family is not from this region. And so my kid's growing up in a place where he doesn't have aunts, uncles, extended family around him that a lot of, you know, like where I grew up, it's like kind of, you know, there were large extended families around. Some of those natural connections would have taken place. So we are pretty intentional in terms of, you know, wanting to, you know, have those other relationships with other families, you know, being careful about who our kids are hanging out with, getting to know their parents, um, wanting to know, you know, their coaches. Again, we've seen enough headlines where parents didn't know the coaches and how that turned out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there's a, that's the active role and that's the empowered role that I can play as a parent um, is, is helping keep, have my kid have a number of options who he ultimately chooses. That's not under my control, but I want to make sure um, I, th I think it's so like a, it's a good example. Um, you know, he was kind of at a new school. That he's at a new school this year. You know, and you're always wondering, kind of like, okay, so who's my kid going to have at that school? Mm -hmm. Who? Because he had he had a couple great, you know, mentors at his old school, and you know, lo and behold, one of his teachers tends to be kind of after school, the place where a group of kids hangs out, and. So, you know, they kind of just hang out, they play some games in this classroom, and there's a real sense of safety with this teacher. Now, will that be the teacher my kid would go to if there's a problem? I, I don't know, but I'm going to try to, I'm going to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be aware, like when something did, you know, my kid was dealing with something that happened at school and he was a little off at his practice after school, the coach was aware. And the coach like said, hey, man, what's going on? Um, so it's just, you know, trying to think about that and realize these other adults are important. You're not going to be the end all um, for your kid, especially like, you know, part of their job during the middle school and high school years is to push us away. I mean, that's 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 part of their deal developmentally. I, I want to know who the other parents, the other people are going to be around them, though. I love that you said that because I think parents really can take that away. Their job is, the, the child's job is to push you away and to accept that 
And then the next step is, okay, how can I facilitate and organize a situation where they can find and seek out mentorship mm. and a safe authority figure, a safe adult relationship, that it doesn't make you a bad parent if they're seeking outside of your relationship with them. So it, I think that's really important that you say. Well, I, th I think the key here is that this is not an excuse for parents to pawn off their children to somebody else. This, mm -hmm. is, this is, right, as much as like a lot of times the parents want to do that, this is a community effort, right? And so you're not also, you're not here to tell your kid that you need to be mentored by this individual, but it's monitoring, it's coaching within your own relationship as a parent and then developing those outside relationships with other adults because you're right, it, it does take a community to raise a child. It's not a one or two parent type of thing. And you know, I think that's why after school programs, karate, dance, tennis, all of these things, plugging your children into as many of these avenues as possible, it doesn't just help them from a physical standpoint and, and a growth standpoint, but it gives them window of opportunity to meet people that are yeah. naturally born as coaches and they, you know, you know, and th they got into that for that purpose. Yeah, I think something that's hard that I see with teenagers is teenage, you know, because if you want to create safety and you want to make, you want to monitor what your kid is doing, it's challenging when the kid doesn't want to talk to you. Mm, yeah. And what do you do about that? Because parents, I often hear them say, well, my kid just goes to their room and they don't talk to me. If the kid is just shut down, doesn't want you to know what's going on, how, how do you engage in, in communication with them? I mean, how do you find out what's going on if the kid doesn't openly share what's going on? Great question. And I, I can, you know, give you an example. Of, of a situation like one day, you know, when uh, my, my kid hopped in the car, but he didn't hop in the front seat, he hopped in the back seat after school. Mm. That never happens. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, you know, kind of once we're kind of out of the carpool line, you know, I, you know, it's like, hey, man, what's, what's going on? Why are you sitting in the back seat? Probably not the most emotionally attuned response, but I made an observation, like, you know, just what was going on. And it was very much like nothing. Mm. And so at that point, I could kind of keep drilling into him and asking him, oh, you know, there must be something wrong. You never do this. I just kind of chose to, you know, just be quiet. And, and then I made a decision on the way home you know, because typically we go home, you know, bags unpacked, you know, maybe get into home homework or he, you know, has a little free time to do something. You know, we stopped at, you know, one of his favorite places to get a snack on the way home. And we had some time together. I so much just wanted to keep asking him. So what happened, dude? I know something's going on. Just didn't ask. Mm. Didn't ask. Just stayed with him. And he ended up getting a snack. We sat down, probably 15 minutes has passed. And, you know, we just, we're just kind of sitting and I'm just trying to be present with my kid. And then about 10 minutes later, the story came out. Mm, nice. And I didn't ask another question, but I was just there. And I think I maybe made a couple of, you know, just observations, you know, yeah, you seem, something seems a little different today. Or, you know, you seem a little quiet today. And I, but I just didn't get into putting him on the stand and asking him tons of questions. Okay. Cause that, and again, that's just good helping behavior, right? You know, we know when people are sometimes in a hurt place, you know, they're trying so hard to kind of figure out what's going on within them. If they're sort of feeling forced to perform or give an answer, that's just more on their plate. So I think one of the things we can we give our children, and I'm a big believer in the that that time after school, like really making time for your kids. Again, it doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be, you know, you're going to be sitting across the table and doing the rundown of the whole day. But finding a time to just, you know, without the screen on, without them in front of the phone just to kind of have some present time with them. And, and having that habit of just kind of 
talking about the day. I'm a big believer in parents modeling appropriately, not again going into all the you know details of their struggles, but you know just being able to emotionally kind of model, um, talking about if they've had a tough moment during the day, and um, and and so I think those are things you can do to create a home situation where um, your kid may be more likely to talk with you about things. I think it's also too in your reaction afterwards. Mm-hmm. That's also key. Because if you're that parent who you're going to go hysterical mm-hmm. after they disclose to you something really rough is happening to school today, now what happens? Well, now I've got to take care of mommy or daddy. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, uh, yeah, I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> I mean, that can also be seen as a sign of bullying too. I mean, yeah, right. I mean, that I feel like that's emotional bullying in itself because now you're creating fear around getting help. Uh, or, exactly, or and I think yeah. Arthur, I think also too, there's the when you're when you're constantly bombarding your kids and trying to force them to tell you mm. what mm. has happened, that is just a reenactment of mm. you're kind of not respecting okay. their choice to be silent. So I have a question. And, I have a question for you. So I mean, yeah. with all the studies, I mean, obviously bullying has been around for for so long, and and now with social media bullying and and that being, I mean, prevalent and everywhere and in so many different forms, are there telltale signs? Are there ways to identify if your child is being bullied at school? You know, for those parents out there that are constantly worried and just and don't are not able to hold space like you did with your son, which is beautiful. Are there any studies that done on what the like commonalities? It's like when we look at you know trauma research. I think we know that you know trauma really looks different in different people, right? And and so, but I think there are some there's some general characteristics of things to look for. I think um, I think the 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 withdrawing you know, socially, um, if you're noticing a change um, in their friend groups or their interest in wanting to be with friends, I think that's something to notice. If you're noticing a change in their attitude towards school um, and wanting to go to school, you know, so, you know, that kid who, you know, they maybe didn't like, not that they're loving having to go to school, but now they're refusing going to school. I think that's a sign something's up. Yeah. I think changes in their sleeping patterns, you know, because they're up at night worrying about about what's going to happen that next day, or you know, you're you're getting the sense that they they might be faking illness. I think is a is a sign, hmm. um, or they're much, you know, and we all know we we all were kids. We 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 know the things we pulled out when we wanted to miss school. Right. Um, you know, you have that gut as a parent. Yeah, you kind of know when your kid is really physically sick, and then you kind of know when it might be something else going on. Pay attention to that, um, and and just other changes in behavior. I think that's the big the biggest one I always tell parents. Like when you notice like something has shifted, like that's pretty significant in how they kind of show up day to day. That's when you need to start asking. You need to start considering what has happened. You know, it's that really trauma-informed approach to parenting or anything, you know, rather than saying, what's wrong with you? You know, why are you doing this? Right. It's really getting curious when you start to see behavior changes in kids, you know, or anybody for that matter. It's probably something that's happened. Yeah. You've identified that your great points, by the way. And I, I feel like my daughter's experienced like all of those throughout mm-hmm. her experience in school. So, and we were able to identify and have those conversations. What would, what would you say is the following step for a parent? Like, how can a parent approach their child in 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 the appropriate way, uh, where they don't re-traumatize them or or rebully them in a sense? Like, mm-hmm. obviously, hold space, but. What, what are some techniques or ways that parents can be part of their child's life who is being bullied and kind of working around that and, and empowering them and, and helping them through that? And I think there's, there's a couple different levels of it. You know, one is sort of what are, you, what are you doing as a parent before the incident happens to set 
the framework right. that acknowledging that something's going wrong is okay. Mm. So what what is the foundation you're laying before the episode? I, I talk a lot about prevention, you know, as really prevention <laughs> really is intervention. Love that. <laughs> you know, Love we, that. We, we miss that part. And, you know, and I like when I'm talking to schools, I'm like, you know, I'm not saying it's too late when you have to do the intervention, but man, if you just would have put a little more attention to the prevention piece, we probably wouldn't have been here. Um, so how do you, how do you, like when you're talking with your kid about the beginning of the school year or you're talking with your kid about expectations about what, you know, what school will be like, you know, sort of reaffirming, you know, like, hey, like, you know, we, we know, you know, we're really hopeful for you about the school year. Um, you know, I know you're excited about these things. And, hey, let's just let's establish some ground rules here. Like we we know that sometimes things aren't perfect at school. And, um, you know, just want to let you know um, we are, you know, we're here. Like if something's going wrong somebody's not treating you well, whether that's a teacher or another kid, um, you know, we're here to listen to you first. And, and, and again, you don't need to make it into a big thing. Okay. Parents overdo it. They use too many words. They lecture, but I think it's just establishing that kind of foundation, that expectation. Um, because they're going to, they're going to file it away. <laughs> they're going to hear you. And hopefully they're going to remember that, you know, when, when and if something comes up for them. You know, I think if, if, if something does, if you're starting to see those changes in, in behavior, um, you're, you're getting the sense something's off, you know, I think it's, you know, when, you know, hopefully a good safe period of time exists, um, it's finding a safe way. And, you, and parents, I just say to you, you have to know your kid best. You've got to know kind of that. you got to know where, where, where your kid opens up, how they open up. Mm. You know, like, you know, does your kid open up when you're, when you're shooting baskets in the driveway? Uh, are they more likely to open up in the car? You know, I find a lot of times it's those kind of not like where you're in their face situations. Mm. Kids feel a little safer. I, 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 it's the kind of walk and talk. That's why I do a lot of walk and talk therapy with kids that are in their teen years because, mm -hmm. you know what? They have a little more power and choice. If they want to turn towards me, they can. But they also have the choice that if it's really difficult, like they can kind of talk without me staring them down kind of thing. So I think, again, ask yourself the question, look back in your kid's history. When have they opened up to you? What have been sort of the, the environments that works best for your kid? Great point. And, and, you know, and provide time and space. And then sometimes you just have to, you've kind of just got to make the observation. You have to make the observation, hey, you know, something seems off. Um, you know, I've got some time now. Um, you know, would you, like, would you like to talk for a few minutes? I love, then, sorry. Yeah, and then and then just be quiet, mm. and let them give them space to choose. Mm. So you know, ask you know ask for permission to to enter in to a difficult conversation, and they may tell you no. And I know it's so hard as a parent to like respect that no, but but sometimes it's the best thing you can do, and it doesn't mean you don't come back to it, but you're giving them some choice in maybe a difficult conversation and, and then you come back to it later, you know, or maybe it comes up at bedtime or, you know, you just continue to make some pro like, you know, as a therapist, we call them process comments. You know, you're just kind of noticing what's happening. And, and, you know, some parents like to use kind of like, you know, some like multiple choice, you know, well, hey, you know, let's play a game, you know, so, um, you know, seems like something's different, you know, did something happen before school, during school, after school that, you know, so you can kind of give them some, again, opportunity to, without kind of going directly, you know, what happened to you kind of thing. 
Probably. I just want to say two things around that. One, I think it's really important that you said, what, how are you modeling your environment? Because I think it's really important for kids to see their parents be human beings and get affected by things and then to provide a language with how they're being affected so right. that when the kid goes through something, it's normalized to go through something and there isn't shame around mm. feeling the uncomfortable feeling and then they have a language to describe to their parents how they're feeling. I think a lot mm. of parents assume that their children just know because they're, they're alive, that they know what a word is. And, and mm. I'm around my five-year-old and I'm often just shocked at how much I say that I naturally just assume he knows what I'm saying. And then I remember, wait a minute, he's five. He doesn't know what this word means. And then I say, do you know what this word means? And he goes, no. And so I'm, I'm literally speaking like a foreign language to him and assuming he should know. So I think the modeling is is so important. And, and then the other thing I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about, okay, here's a scenario for you. Male client goes to a prestigious school, the students have a lot of money. The kids are often going to really big universities. And this client, this, this, this young boy is getting severely bullied. Goes home to the parents. The parents go, to, tells the parents what's going on. The parents go to the school and nothing happens. Ooh. This is happening a lot. And I don't know what to do about it. I don't know what to tell those parents other than, you know, if those parents have the option to move to another school because they are financially stable enough to do that, that is a solution. But what do you do for the kids who aren't financially stable enough to move? Well, is that really a solution? To move? Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I think it's a temporary solution depending on how bad the bullying is. But I also think kids need to learn how to confront that but often kids are confronting it they are going to the authority figures that are supposed to be supporting them and often those authority figures aren't supporting them yeah it's it's alarming and so i i think you're you're bringing up a really important issue that you know you're seeing it in your clients i've seen it in my clients as well and you know, so, I mean, again, if you're just talking to the parent, if you're in that situation, you know, you, you, you want to, again, on the prevention side, when you're looking at schools, and I know it's an awkward question to ask, but you ask those questions about, you know, kind of like, so how do you handle, you know, situations like bullying? You know, what are your policies around those kinds of things? I think it's really telltale <laughs> the schools who have the policies and the schools that don't have the policies okay well and it's also to, to add another thing is the schools that have the policies who tell you their policies but that don't actually do the policy it's like one yeah, thing then, it, it's in writing yeah we have it yeah. but then i it goes back to I, you know honestly i don't think there is a solution because you're right it's human nature to outweigh the cost benefit to stepping into a situation it's like the same person you see somebody with a gun and they're about to start shooting you're going to have right. certain people that are going to step in and try to tackle that person you have others that are going to try to hide you have others going to try to run i mean it's just human nature of what you're going to do in these types of situations i don't think there's a solution there could be options there's, i mean I, there has to be some options because these sure. are some real life things that people are are yeah. going through and I also am amazed because I've asked people in the school systems so what do you do when bullying happens in your school oh there's no bullying here <laughs> and I'm like you're a human being there's bullying everywhere to stay ignorant is right. is so dangerous yeah you know I, I think there's no harm in going forward and letting the school know that you're aware that something occurred. And I mean, I have, I, I think silence is not the answer <laughs> in this situation. Mm. And as frustrating as it might be to get silence back, um, I, I, I really do believe that sometimes it, people have to hear it 20 times before action is taken. You know, it's, and I think we saw this happen in our public school system 
And, you know, like our public school system, there, there are a lot more policies and follow through because there were, there's even been legislation passed mm. <laughs> that public schools have to have like an anti-bullying policy. Mm. They have to have a set of consequences. And, and so it's kind of like the, the equations tilted differently um, in the public school sector. A lot of times in the private school sector, you know, there, there aren't the over, there aren't the larger mm. oversights yeah. for, for policies and whatnot. But Again, I think, you know, saying nothing, there's no chance anything's going to happen or anything's going to change. Um, you may get into a situation where you say something and you get back that sort of, you know, really dismissive, minimizing kind of remark. And, you know, obviously that's information for you. And depending on your kid, you know, you're going to have to make some decisions about, you know, can I help equip my kid on my own with other supports to manage this? Or do I need to start looking for a different place for my kid? Mm. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. And I do think, I mean, I do think that there are things we can do. There's skills we can teach kids, but. It's called but, jujitsu. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I, yeah. But I think there's a. You know, like any, anybody who says the, the solution to bullying is, well, get to the bullies and you just need to get the bullies to stop. It's systemic. It's very systemic. And yes, there's a piece for taking those kids who are being aggressive, trying to understand what's going on with them and why they're acting this stuff out. But then there are there's this, there's this really important systemic layer that you know, we, we need a lot of more, we need a lot more work on, um, particularly in certain types of settings um, that I think parents have to be honest with themselves. You know, what's more important, you know, my kid graduating from this highly ranked school or my kid being safe? Mm. What's really more important? Yeah. And I think, you know, you brought up jujitsu and I completely, I, wasn't joking. I know. Yeah. I mean, I think this is why in the show Cobra Kai, it's such a phenomenon because the kids who are bullied, they feel a sense of empowerment by knowing that they can defend mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. And for someone like me who has been mm -hmm. bullied, I do jujitsu, I do mixed martial arts. The 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 safety mm -hmm. I feel within my body now is is beyond mm -hmm. different than the way it felt before right. I knew how to protect myself. And mm -hmm. so for parents out there, I would highly encourage you to investigate some really good mixed martial arts classes or jujitsu, especially for young girls. Um, mm. And, you know, um, the, the other thing I think what's a problem in our system as well is there's not enough attention to support the transformation and the healing of a bully. You know, mm -hmm. we immediately want to ostracize them and demonize mm. them and villainize yeah. them, but we cannot, why, if a bully really wants to change and they, yeah. they actually start to feel some remorse for their behaviors and they come out and they're afraid they're going to be canceled or they're afraid that they're going to lose, you know, just lose any type of love and, and, and support, they're not going to do it. So I think there has to be a mixture of supporting the victim, supporting the bystanders, Absolutely. supporting the bully. Mm. Yeah, because because what happens? It's It's no different than... If we take that teacher or that coach who was abusive in one environment, and now we put them in another environment, yeah. there's nothing that's been learned along the way. And, and particularly when we're looking at these younger kids, they're still malleable, right? I mean, I think I really believe and I have a lot of hope in, you know, these kids that are in that 10 to 15 age range, particularly, you know, they, they still have a lot of opportunity to learn and change and grow from the mistakes they've made, you know? I mean, some of my best learning experiences in my life have been when I messed up and I hurt someone, you know, and I wasn't or wasn't sensitive or whatever. Having to deal with that and face that, like in a healthy, supportive way, not just a punitive way, that's how we make full human beings i mean that's, that's part of that's part of our job to help people grow up and mature 
well, is think, to help them learn to grow from those experiences. I think it's absolutely important for us not to brush it off and just say, well, hey, you know, he's a bully. He'll be a bully because that's going to carry on for the rest of their life. Then, they're, oh, they're, yeah. then they become bullies in the workplace. Then they become bullies to their own families. They eventually start having it's like a, it's a never ending thing. And I don't think you're ever too old to change. Right. It's like even, yeah. you know, I feel there's always a way to create to create empathy and to create love and, and to create support and actually welcome those individuals. I mean, again, if you look back at it, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, I, I truly believe that a lot of the bullies that either, at, like you said, either at one point were bullied, were neglected, were there was something there. So if you look at that, you'll, you'll start feeling a little bit sorry for them. And it's like trying to figure mm -hmm. out like, OK, well, well, how can we get to that root problem? Yeah, you know, I think it's I really love people knowing that we are animals in our core, like we're <laughs> highly evolved animals. Mm -hmm. I so I highly, but, well, <laughs> we our brains tried to evolve at a strange <laughs> pace. But um, I think, you know, to what you said earlier, Arthur, survival of the fittest. You know what I mean? And in order for me to have survived against the big tiger in the jungle or a bigger human back in the day, I had to be more powerful than you. Mm -hmm. So I think it's acknowledging that we all have this innate need to feel powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think it's learning how to use our power, access our power and use it for good rather than for abuse. And I think there's a beautiful process that happens once you gain that power and realize like, oh, I have impact in this world. My behaviors impact another individual. And I think for the bully, I'm not really sure what the process, how do you create empathy for someone who's essentially survived by not having empathy? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. I Rachel. know, but I just thought about it. Like, what do you no, do? I'll tell a little story, though. I, Robert, I do you have the solution, by the way? Please don't announce it on here. Uh, like, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a call <laughs> afterwards, and we'll we'll come up with something. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Let me give you a quick story, though. I, I was I was meeting with a client the other day. It was a guy, you know, in his really in his mid forties, and you know, really, why he's coming in is he he's he's really had a number of sort of situations with his wife where he's just really missed it emotionally. Like just did not read the situation well and, and ended up doing something pretty hurtful. And, and so we started talking about kind of like his growing up years and um, his early experiences with difficult things and the response that he got from his parents or didn't get from his parents. And 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 let this guy like big, you know, not a not a on the outside sensitive kind of guy. Like he just started crying. And and it was he started then just talking about some incidents where he as a kid had come home from school crying, something had happened. And the message he had gotten, you know, as a as an eight eight-year-old was oh, come on, that wasn't that big of a deal. You need to toughen up. And he remembers, like, that's when he turned off his emotions. Mm -hmm. And he was able to kind of kind of reconnect with kind of that, that boy in himself and, and really have some compassion towards himself, like for what he didn't get back then, and have some understanding of why he was where he is today. And, and really, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited for him because, you know, I mean, he's been living this way for, you know, 40 some years yeah. and, and it was kind of like eye opening. He's like, I never thought of it that way. And I never cried. I'd never, you know, I don't, I can't, ima I can't believe I didn't come in here today thinking that's what was going to happen. So I think, I think the empathy I think with very, very few exceptions, okay, there are a few exceptions <laughs> where, where people aren't real capable of empathy, but I think we have to kind of assume that, you know, most of the people we interact with and we work with, they have that capability. They just oftentimes don't have the skill and know how, knowing how to access it or how to, and or they need some tools to learn how to develop it. And I've seen guys in their 70s who spent a lifetime kind of being insensitive 
that, you know, something happens at that point in their life where they're just, they kind of look around and they realize, wow, I don't have much time left. Um, you know, I, I realize I've been hurting a lot of people and they're able to really transform with some, with some work on themselves. Yeah, I think that's a really great tool is, is helping people to reintroduce themselves to their inner child, to their, to their, the part of themselves that is innocent. And I, I think really helping people look at their foundation of life and, and what were there. I think there's so much change and transformation that can happen when people learn to explore their self-defense mechanisms and their survival str uh, strategies, because I think turning off your emotions is a way to survive a really scary childhood or a neglected childhood or you know if you've been hurt by someone the best way to not deal with that is to just turn your emotions off and it's very normal mm, yeah so uh, i think that's uh, a really important solution yeah no absolutely uh robert I, we really appreciate you coming on with us today i mean a lot of great insight a lot of great trajectory some good planning for parents out there um, we definitely have to have you back out because I definitely want to talk about crisis intervention and the work that you do with schools, especially in the world, you know, leading from bullying to school shootings. And, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like what steps are schools taking and what measures? I, I think there's a, a lot of fascinating information. I'm sure you have a ton of data on that. And yeah. uh, so we definitely would love to have you back on. I, I would absolutely love to come back on. Um, I really enjoyed my time with you both today. Love what you're doing. Keep doing it. We need more forums for people to sit, reflect, talk about these these real issues that are going on for um, in our world, in our kids' world. We do have one last question. We a we typically ask all of our guests uh, if you had an opportunity to go back 15 years from now and talk to Robert. What type of advice would you give him? Oh wow. It's a great question. Listen to the fears that fear is in, in, in maybe learn how to respond and face fear a little differently. Mm. I, I think, um, boy, I took a, it took me many, many years to um, kind of acknowledge that fear is okay and is a normal part of the human experience <laughs> and, um, and to step, to step into it. And, and it's not as scary when you sort of step into it. Mm. So what you're saying is I should step into a bee of uh, hive, a bee of hive, a bee of hive, a beehive, a <laughs> beehive. <laughs> Duly yeah. noted. Thanks for the advice, Robert. I'll, I'll let go. you know how that goes. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Robert. I, I, right. uh, you know, as always, you're one of my favorites and I know you'll be back. So thank you for your time. And I, I truly right. look at you as just an angel walking on this earth, helping the people that you do and, and providing the, uh, just the support that you do for people. You're a true hero. Right. Yeah. Thanks Robert. Um, and I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of got mental health. Don't forget to follow us, follow us on Apple podcasts and leave us a, a let me just try that again. I want to thank everyone for listening to Got Mental Health. Don't forget to follow us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. We greatly appreciate your feedback and come back next week for an all new episode. Thanks, everyone.